We're so glad that you're with us this morning. I would like for Ms. Rebecca to come and join us. We're going to read the call to worship this morning. If you'll join us, choir's going to join us. We're going to share the call to worship. Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him boast, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Well, good morning, church. If you will, turn your Bibles to the book of James. We're in chapter 1 today. Again, verses 5 through 8, we're talking about wisdom today. Now, typically on uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, the, uh, the thought is, well, you should be talking about the resurrection today, Pastor. And I am, but we're going to stay in the book of James because the resurrection of Jesus Christ has everything to do with our pursuit of wisdom. You know... Have you ever found yourself in a situation, I know I have, when, when you said to yourself or maybe to someone, you know, I, I really don't know how to handle this. I'm, I'm not sure what's the best way to take the next step to move forward from where I am in this moment. What you're looking for in that moment is wisdom. You're not looking for just good advice, not just knowledge. You're looking for wisdom. Wisdom serves us so well because it, it applies knowledge to our lives, things that we know or should know. So yesterday, my family and I spent some time with, um, with our new in-laws, I guess. My son married in December. We spent, we spent some time with, with Mallory's family, and, um, and they have a pickleball court in their driveway. And I've told you before, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of competitive. Um, and my two sons challenged me and Mallory's father to a game. And I needed some wisdom to tell them it's probably a bad idea because I am feeling it this morning. <laughs> my legs are a little tight. If I catch a cramp in my left calf, I just understand it was because of pickleball yesterday. And um, whether it's in the driveway or on a, on a real court or whatever it is, I'm, I'm going to go 100% if I have to, especially to, to, to beat my own sons. So anyway, I, I, I needed some wisdom yesterday. And my wife wasn't there to say, Orton, is this a good idea? Should you be doing this right now? We all, we all experience times in life where we need some help. And there, there's only really one source of wisdom that will not ever fail us. There's lots of wisdom in the world, and much of it comes from experience of others who describe, explain, and share with us what they've learned, sometimes the hard way, so that we don't make the same mistakes. But sometimes we're in a situation where we don't know who to turn to. Our only hope, our only help is God. And folks, let me tell you, God is the first place you should turn anyway. If you recall last week, we talked about the church that James is writing to here who are being troubled. They're facing trials simply because they are followers of Jesus. They're being pressured and ostracized and marginalized in their culture. They're being pushed aside in so many ways. They're they're experiencing trials And James tells them, we saw last week, to count it joy, count it all joy when you you face trials of any kind. Because you you know that the trial is going to produce this kind of endurance in your life that over time will mature you and make you more complete as a follower of Jesus. But what do you do if you're having a hard time knowing what to do next? Next. What if you don't feel mature? What if you don't feel like you're complete? What if you're confused? What if you're weak? What if you just don't know what the next best step is for you? The answer is to apply what God has told us of himself in his word. Apply that knowledge that God gives to us from the Bible and from the Spirit and use that 
in our lives. To step in that way, to walk in that way, it's that God commands, and we are then living by God's wisdom. So let's look at it together, James 1. We're going to read 2 through 8 this morning. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. He must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." Turning to God, asking God for wisdom is a, a spiritual act of faith. It's the result of, of maturity and concern for godliness. And it starts at the cross of Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ is the answer for the wisdom we lack. I'm going to show you how today, all right? He says, James, James says, but if you lack wisdom. If, if any of you lacks wisdom, if you know that you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He doesn't say ask your neighbor. He says ask of God. Start with God. If you know that you lack wisdom and you don't have what you need in that moment to do the right thing, the best thing, that's a very important level of awareness. You know that you lack wisdom. That, that is a, a, a place of humility and turning to God is the best place for you to start. Whenever you know you lack wisdom, whenever you know you lack something, it would be like, like taking your glasses, if you wear glasses, and holding them up to the light. And you see all the little smudges and the, the smears in there, right? Right? It's like you, maybe, you, maybe you think you can see it, but when you really hold it up to the light, it really exposes, man, this is really dirty glasses. Let me clean these real quick. Sorry. It, it, oh, that's much better. Let me do the other one. It, it, exposes, it exposes what you possibly couldn't see before. And when we turn to the Lord, we're turning to the source of all good wisdom, perfect wisdom, endless wisdom. So normally what we do is we'll go to a book, right? Or we'll, we'll read some kind of self-help book, some philosophy, some expert. Or we'll go to Google. You know, like, what is the world have to say about this. And look, there may be some perfectly great websites that you can go to with some good, good wisdom, but I would, I would venture to say that the wisdom you receive from those websites, those people got it from the Bible. Maybe you ask someone you trust. Those are all good things. But we start with God because God is the source of wisdom. Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The word of God makes wise those who, knew, who know they need wisdom. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. That word knowledge there is interchangeable with the word wisdom. Fearing the Lord, knowing the Lord is the beginning of gaining wisdom. Not the end, the beginning of gaining wisdom. But wisdom in the Lord is a matter of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to the book of Colossians. If you have your Bible with you this morning, Colossians chapter 2. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes here to the church in Colossae. Chapter 2, verse 1, Colossians. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery that is Christ himself, watch this, in whom all are, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So what does Paul say here about where we find knowledge? He says it's in Christ. 
are the, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If there's wisdom, if it's good, it's in Christ. If there's knowledge and it's good, it's in Jesus Christ. Christ. And what Paul is writing to the Colossians to tell them is, and the same thing James, James is, is you must pursue Jesus in order to see and to know and understand and apply the wisdom that can only be found in Christ. It's a matter of the gospel. You can search other places. You can look other places, but you will not find what you need unless you turn to Jesus. The, 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 the wisdom of the cross is what leads us to a place of humility that then helps us to understand that we lack wisdom. Because the, 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 the cross of Christ exposes our lack. It exposes our need. It exposes our hearts that would turn inwardly and seek our own good, our own pleasure, our own selfish desires, rather than glorifying God. But the cross also calls us to the life that, God, that only God can offer. And in that life, when we receive that life that God offers to us by faith in Jesus, we receive the wisdom that comes from that knowledge of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says this, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. Now, wait a minute. You say, Pastor, are you, are, you, are you telling me that I have to become foolish to become wise? Well, that word foolish is a particular word that's used in the Bible, and it has everything to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ. Because in that time, the cross was foolishness to people. You can't be saved by some man dying on a cross for your sin. You, you, you can't be made whole. You can't find wisdom by trusting in this, this Jewish teacher who died on a Roman cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Turn there with me. We have, we have a lot of scripture to, to, to look at today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to how Paul describes this to the church in Corinth, who believe themselves to be wise. And Paul says, well, unless you come to Jesus, you're not really as wise as you think you are. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness. Right there is what Paul is referencing in Colossians. I mean, sorry, in, in 1, 1, 1 Corinthians 3. In order to become wise, you must become foolish, turning to the cross. He says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? He asks. Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Those who turned to worldly wisdom, the wisdom of the age came up empty, came up short. He says, but God saved, saved people who believe through the foolishness of the cross. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, verse 22, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Folks, if you need wisdom, and I'm certain all of us at some point within the next 24 hours will, you've got to go back to the cross. The cross reveals our condition, our spiritual condition. We lack righteousness. We lack goodness. We lack holiness. We're broken. We're lost. We're foolish sinners. We're condemned under the judgment of God. But God says, you don't have to be condemned. I give you my son, my son who is perfect, who doesn't lack anything, who is not foolish, who is not a sinner, who is not under condemnation, but he takes on your condemnation. He takes on your foolishness. He takes on your judgment. He pays for it himself so you then could understand by faith in him what wisdom really looks like. You have to be free in Christ to know the wisdom that God gives freely to those who believe. The cross of Christ opens the door to the vast treasure of God's wisdom. But you can only access that through Jesus Christ. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, 
He's talking about wisdom. I am the wisdom of God. No man comes to the wisdom of God except through Jesus. That's the only answer for you today. And stop trying to do it on your own. You're wasting your time. You're beating your head against the wall. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Christ has done it. It's finished. Trust him. It does not mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean you're going to have an immediate answer for the problem you're facing. But what it does promise you is you will take wise steps in the midst of that difficulty, in the midst of that trial that will honor the Lord. That's the goal. Those who think that God just wipes away all their problems the moment they believe, they didn't get that from the Bible. The word of God does not promise us that all your troubles just melt away all of a sudden. No. James says, when you face trials of many kind, of various kind, when you face them, who do you trust? And if you need wisdom, where do you turn? Do you turn to Jesus or do you turn to yourself? The cross opens the door to the wisdom of God. Which is why James can write this to believers. Go to God, he says. That's your answer. You see, God promises that to answer those or help those who ask. James says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Do you know that's what God wants for you? God wants wisdom for you. He wants you to have that knowledge of who he is in your heart. Psalm 51 verse 6, behold, you, God, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Why does he say innermost? Why does he say the hidden part? Because that's who we are. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. If you studied Genesis today and, 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 and Romans today, the heart of man is who we are on the inside. It's the core of who you are. It's your moral center. It's your, it's your understanding of the world. It's your worldview. It's who you are as a person. It's inside. The psalmist says, God, give me wisdom inside. Because what's inside is what comes out. It's how you think. It's how you live. It's what you say. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. From the heart, a person acts and lives. And so if there's wisdom in the innermost being then you will live a life that is wise and honoring to, to the Lord. But I, I want you to notice here in James what, how, how he describes the Lord God and, 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 and how we gain wisdom or, or what God does. He says, God gives to all generously and without reproach. God's wisdom is never ending. It doesn't have a limit. It's overabundance. It's plentiful. It's overflowing. It's a well that you can go to as often as you need, and it will never run dry. Never. Because he's, and he's, and, and he's generous, which he always gives you more than what you need. He blesses you in abundance if you would trust in him. Man, there are so many people, and I've talked about this in, 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 in different ways before, but there's so many believers in this room who've lived a long life following the Lord, and they can tell you those, those two paths. They can tell you seeking their own wisdom, and they can tell you seeking the Lord's wisdom. And God has never failed them when they sought the Lord's wisdom. He's never let them down, but they have hit some real roadblocks. They have run through some real difficult times when they sought their own wisdom, their own way. There's so much applicable truth to this for us. And we have to remember just how generous God is in his wisdom. Romans 11, just hear, hear, hear these words. Romans 11, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forevermore. Amen. The wisdom of God is unsearchable. It doesn't mean you don't seek it. It means the more you seek, the more you find, and you will never find the end of it. 
You don't have the mind of God. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. But if you seek it, you will gain that wisdom and that knowledge, and he will give to you generously. And it also says that he gives without reproach. God does not take offense when you come to him for wisdom. He doesn't criticize you for coming to him. See Jimmy Morgan right there. Oh, there's, oh, you again, Jimmy. Oh, you're back for more wisdom today? Weren't you here just yesterday, Jimmy? Right? God doesn't chastise us. He doesn't say, I gave you my spirit. I gave you my word. You should have figured this out by now. No. He says, come, come on. What you need? I got it. He's generous. But again, you have to know you need it. You have to know, you have to admit that you need it, that you don't know. That's hard. It's hard to admit we don't know. Young people, pardon me, church, if I'm shifting to a more sarcastic tone. Young people, teenagers, young adults, we, your parents, your grandparents, your elders in some sense, we understand, we understand that you know everything. <laughs> Don't clap, Tim. It's not funny. <laughs> yes, yes, look, yes. We have jobs, college degrees. We've achieved some things in our life. But we know you know everything. You don't need any kind of wisdom, any kind of instruction, any kind of teaching. We're just your dumb parents, right? We just, we make money. We put a roof over your head, put a bed for you to sleep in. We buy you, you know, pot pockets and pizza rolls and Oreo cookies, right? We drive you around in the car we bought and put the gas in it all over town so you can do all your activities and, and hang out with your nerdy little friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just your parents. We don't know anything. Look, look, I, I'm fully aware I'm saying all these things with my own parents sitting right here in the front row. <laughs> and I was that teenager. They couldn't tell me anything. I knew everything. I know, I know. And it was a problem. It was a problem. But I grew up a little bit, then I got married, and it became my wife's problem. <laughs> Good luck with that, Ginger, right? <laughs> Young people, in all seriousness, let me, let me just tell you, your parents are not offended if you come for them for wisdom. They're happy to say, Mom, Dad, I need some help with this. So don't be afraid to ask people in your life to help you. But understand something. Parents, this is for you. If they come to you for wisdom, ask them, have you prayed about it first? Have you sought God's wisdom first? Because even parents can have a little bit of flawed wisdom sometimes. So young people, God will never fail you. Old people, God will never fail you. Everybody in between, God will never fail you. Start with God. And then go to the people that you trust have sought the Lord as well, and you will find the kind of wisdom you need. Without reproach, he is not offended when we ask him. You may be asking, though, but, but okay, so how does God give us this wisdom? How do we get it? We just, we just pray and it just shows up in our brains, right? Like, how does it come to us? Well, there are two primary ways, through his word and by his spirit, okay? Through the word of God, we we, we gain this wisdom. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. For what he speaks, what has God spoken? His word. So what he speaks comes understanding, our understanding of who he is and who we are in light of him. Proverbs 2, verse 10 and 11. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will guard you. Understanding will watch over you. If you have planted the word of God in your heart and mind, when you need wisdom, it'll be there. If you don't know the truth, if you don't know the truth of God's word, when you go looking for something, you're not going to find it. You must be planting this constantly in your heart and in your mind. So when you're challenged, when you're faced with that difficulty, the truth of God is already planted deep in your heart. It's grown deep roots. It's strong. You can depend on it. 
God gives wisdom in his eternal word. And he brings it to mind by the power of his Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, Jesus is teaching his disciples. He says, these things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So here's how it works. You know the word of God. You learn the word of God. You study the word of God. You commit to the word of God. And then whenever you need it, God help me, I need wisdom, the spirit makes it alive in your heart and your mind. You're like, yes, that's, that's the truth. That's the way I should go. That's the step I should take. This is how I should act. This is what I should say. Again, there are testimonies here today of people that have experienced this very thing. The spiritual knowledge they gained from the study of God's word came to mind. They remembered it when the pressure was turned up. The Spirit brought it to their awareness, their understanding, and they were able to apply it. The Word of God equips us to do the work of God, to serve God, to honor God. The Holy Spirit empowers us to carry that out. This is where wisdom comes from. It's taking the knowledge of God's Word and applying it to our lives. But what's the guarantee that this is even going to happen? How, how in the world should we even trust that this is going to work? If you look at it with me in James again, verse 6, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought to not expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Okay, so how can I come to God asking for wisdom and not doubt? Because Jesus is alive. The fact that Christ Jesus is alive secures God's promises for you. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is our reason for faith in God's promise of wisdom. The fact that Christ is alive today guarantees it. That all the promises of God are right and true. You can trust them. He says, ask in faith without doubting. Doubt is unbelief. Doubt is saying, you know, God, maybe I don't fully trust you about this. So if you feel like it, if I've been good enough, give me some wisdom. If not, I'll have to look elsewhere. Or doubting is saying, you know, I'm not sure if God can do this. Maybe I'll ask anyway just in case. No, it's going to God and say, God, I know you want to give me wisdom. You desire that in the innermost part of who I am. I've given myself to you. I've trusted your word. God, give me wisdom now. Faith, believing that he is true, that he will give you what he promised. And that promise is secured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You should not expect to get it if you doubt. You're like the sea, the surf of the sea, tossed to and fro by the wind. But those who are of faith in Christ, those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have committed their lives to him are standing firm like a rock in a river. You don't get moved around. You're solid. You're steady. You're steadfast in the Lord. So when you pray, when you fall to your knees, and you say, God, help me. I need your wisdom. He's there. He blesses you because you're in Christ. You're rooted your life in Jesus Christ. You don't doubt. You have faith because faith is what pleases God. So you trust him. You're not double-minded, James says. You have two minds. I want what I want. I want what God wants. Maybe I can figure out how to make both of them happen. Folks, God's, God's economy doesn't work that way. God's kingdom doesn't work that way. It's all in, 100%. You can't be double-minded. You can't have half a heart committed to, to God. Complete trust and dependence on Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 21 and 22, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. All things that are of God, all things that are of God's will, you ask, you will receive. Guaranteed. Because Jesus is alive. When he walked out of that tomb, that resurrection Sunday, every promise of God 
was sealed and secured. Now, if Jesus isn't alive, if he was crucified on that cross and they put him in that tomb and they rolled the stone and, and his bones are somewhere out there in, in Israel, we might as well pack up our bags and go home, folks. We're wasting our time. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, if Jesus isn't alive, then we are to be most pitied of all people because we put our faith in a dead man. But if he is alive, if he is risen, if he is reigning this very moment, then everything that God has said is 100% true. Every promise, every warning, every judgment, true. 2 Corinthians 1.20, for as many as are the promises of God in him, in Christ, they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. It includes wisdom. So whenever you're struggling and you're not sure, do you believe Jesus is alive? If the answer is yes, then you can trust that God's going to give you the wisdom he promised. He doesn't lie. He doesn't deceive. He doesn't manipulate. He tells the truth. He says, trust me and I will give to you what you need. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter says who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If you have a hope that is alive, it stands to reason then that you should be stirred, compelled to seek wisdom where that hope began. The source of that hope is where you turn for the wisdom you need. Look, I I wish I could just tell you every possible situation and the answer for all of that. I can't do that. It's not time for that. God knows. God understands. God is with you in that moment. You're never alone. You're never truly alone when you surrender to Jesus. And what that means then, if he's always with you, his wisdom is always with you. But you must seek it believing, knowing that Jesus Christ is alive, interceding for you at the right hand of God the Father. Have you ever stopped to think about this? And when he said, I go to prepare a place for you, John 14. I'm going to make a place for you. I'm going to come back, and when I do, I'm going to bring you to where I am. That, that, that's a future, a future vision, a future glory. That's in John 14. In Matthew 28, he tells his disciples, and I will be with you always. He's, he's leading us. He's walking with us. The resurrected Christ walking us to that place he's made for us. He's bringing us there. And the expectation is that we would live lives that are wise, fruitful, and honoring to him. So if I could just give a, 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 a challenge to you today on this, on this Easter Sunday. I often call it diagnostic questions. Who are you trusting for wisdom right now in your life? I don't doubt there's a group of people in this room that are going through some really hard stuff. Some really, really difficult times. Who or what is your wisdom right now? If it's not God, you're lacking But if you know you lack, ask God who gives generously and without taking offense, and it will be given to you. For those that are not believers today, you you came with the family, you're here, you heard the music, you saw the baptism. There's, There's nothing more important for you than this moment right here. You are lost. And what that means is that you do not have a relationship with God. You're cut off from God because of your sin. But your sin does not have to destroy you. It will if you let it. And it will if you never repent. But if you repent and turn to Jesus today, he saves you. He restores you. He washes away every stain. 
And when he looks at you, when God looks at you, he sees a child, a saint, a beloved one. And he will pour out his knowledge and his wisdom to you. But you must come to faith in Jesus. You must confess you are a sinner. You must admit this truth and then come to God for what you lack, which is the hope of Christ in your heart. But when you do, you are free. I had a good meeting with Joshua Ashford a couple of weeks ago. He told me his story. I could just hear in his voice the genuineness of his testimony. He tried so long, so hard to do it his own way. And he didn't do it with the, with, with the wisdom of God. But when he finally figured out that his way wasn't going to work, that wisdom of God began to be stirred in his heart and his mind. And his surrender to Jesus was the best, wisest thing he could do. For the sake of his own life, for the sake of his marriage, for his family, for his friendships, he knew that coming to Jesus, surrendering to Jesus was the only and the best way. And he did it. And he could say it with a smile on his face, a man that does not regret his decision. And there's so many more here today who don't regret that decision. So if Jesus has saved you, turn to him for the wisdom you need to honor him with your life. On this Easter Sunday and all the Sundays and all the days in between, surrender to God for the wisdom you need. Why would you rob yourself of this resource? Well, knowing that God has this endless treasure of wisdom, why would you never access that by faith? Trust him today. Come to Christ today. Whatever you lack, God will give. If you would bow your head with me. I'll be standing here as we sing in a moment. If you would like to profess faith in Jesus Christ today before this, this church, I pray you do so. Don't be afraid of these people. They love you. They love you. They want nothing more than for you to walk with Jesus. Don't hesitate to make that step of faith today. Believer, if you need some wisdom, ask someone to help you. Grab them by the arm and say, can you pray for me? I need wisdom from the Lord. Father God, your word promises us wisdom when we know we lack it. I feel like every day I lack it. So I ask that you would help us today to remember that you are an endless treasure of wisdom, God that your word and your spirit move in the lives of your people to give us the answers we need so that we may honor you in every decision, every step we take in this life. God, you are abundantly good and nothing tells that story more than the death of Christ on that cross. The ultimate sacrifice, the depth of mercy for sinners like us. And as those who are redeemed, Father, let us be faithful to seek wisdom from Christ and Christ alone. I pray for my church, Lord. May we be a light in the darkness in this world. Teach us to walk faithfully, Lord, and to know that that will only happen if we as a body are seeking your wisdom in our lives. So God, may you move in this moment before, your, before us today, Father, in us today, Father. For the glory of your name. In Christ's name, amen.